That worked really well, better than I was expecting. Um, welcome, everyone. It is wonderful to have you here. Uh, for many of you back here uh, at Harvard Kennedy School, uh, I'm Doug Elmendorf. I'm the dean of the Kennedy School, um, which is about the best job going, because I get a chance to come and learn from all of my colleagues and from all of our guests at the school and from all of our students about important and interesting matters of the world. Um, so welcome today uh, to the 13th annual Global Empowerment Meeting. I'm just thrilled that you're here to join us for the set of thought-provoking conversations that we're about to have. As I think you know, the Global Empowerment Meeting is the flagship event of Harvard's Center for International Development. Every year, the center hosts uh, uh, an event gathering together a uh, distinguished group of policymakers, scholars, and uh, practitioners to talk with some of the world's foremost experts on economic development. Now, the shared goal of all of us who come to these meetings is to empower people and societies to make lives better. That's why it's the Global Empowerment Meeting. Um, this year, we have a special uh, production. Um, this meeting is being hosted not only by the Center for International Development, but also by our Malcolm Wiener Center for Social Policy. Uh, CID, as you know, is a hub for Harvard's work on development around the world. The Malcolm Wiener Center for Social Policy focuses mostly on social policy in the United States. Uh, but both centers are firmly committed to serious research and then to bringing the evidence from that research to bear directly for people who are running governments and making decisions that are affecting people's lives. Both centers also share a deep interest in inequality, uh, its causes and consequences, and in policy approaches that can be put to, into practice to reduce inequality and increase opportunity. And that's what we'll be talking about here uh, during this conference. We'll have a particular focus, not surprisingly, on uh, the pandemic uh, and its, in many cases, terribly damaging consequences. Uh, but also, this is a place where we, as a colleague of mine says, we don't just admire problems, we try to solve them. And so we'll talk not just about the problems, but specifically about ways to generate economic and social recoveries around the world that are both strong and broad-based. Uh, we all understand that uh, gender and race, ethnicity, socioeconomic position can have tremendous consequences for people's lives, for good and for ill. And it's our responsibility to try to ensure that our economic and social systems around the world um, are not benefiting some disproportionately, but are bringing everybody along as best we can uh, to share in the fruits of overall economic growth. So we'll be talking about ways to broaden opportunity uh, and to broaden people's uh, chances to thrive in their lives. Um, there are no simple recipes for success, as you know, uh, and certainly no recipes that will work everywhere for everybody all of the time. But uh, I am not daunted. I don't think we should be daunted. Um, the people in this room, the people that we know and you know who aren't in the room, um, have built uh, a huge amount of expertise in how we can advance broadly shared prosperity. And we're building more expertise all the time. Every day, the people at the Kennedy School and our friends who come to, come to us today are learning more about what works and what doesn't. And the goal of this meeting is to put our heads together and work together to learn from each other so we can all be more effective when we go back out after this meeting and try to make a positive difference in the world. So um, we're just delighted that you can be here. Um, in the past years, I know these conversations have been incredibly fruitful, uh, I think in practical ways, and also incredibly fruitful in terms of our enjoyment of the learning we can do with each other uh, and our sense of partnership um, as we go forward. So it's great to see you all, um, great to have you here, great for me to have a chance to be part of this, but I'm not an expert, I'm gonna sit down and and listen and learn. I'm going to turn uh, the microphone over uh, to my colleague and friend, Asim Kwaja, 
who is the director of the Center for International Development. Asim, please. Hi, everyone. Um, Doug Aldrin introduced me. I'm Asim Khwaja. I'm the director for the Center for International Development. Um, my job is to, as quickly as possible, get out of your way uh, so we can actually have real content people. Uh, I, I will be cameoing on one panel, thanks to Jishnu. Um, so you'll see me again. But really, what I'm hoping to get done today is really start what I think will be a fascinating day and a half of conversations. Um, and. Uh, I'll be sitting around here, so you should grab me when nothing is working or when you're upset about something, I'm to blame. Um, when things are going well, I will tell you who to congratulate. It is not me, uh, and I'll tell you at the end. Um, but, but on a, a more serious note, I wanted to thank Dave, uh, Dave Deming, uh, who is the uh, director of the Wiener Center and happens to also be our academic dean. Um, uh, I wanted to thank Dave for co-hosting uh, this year's uh, GEM with me. Dave will be, we're bookending the event. Dave will be closing it out. Uh, I'm just starting it off. Um, you know, one thing that we started putting together, so when you think of what GEM is, every year we try and come together on a theme which we think is a, is a deep, consistent problem in development. Uh, and we've done this every year. Um, especially in light of the pandemic, this year's theme was inequality. It's clear that a lot of us uh, are struggling even two, easier, two years post uh, on all sorts of issues uh, which have been pre-existing, but if anything have been highlighted uh, by the pandemic, have been brought uh, to very stark light. Um, and as much as we are, are suffering and still trying to heal from the losses, some of us have experienced at a personal level, some of us experienced it at a collective level, what my sort of hope for our event, our day and a half, is not just to come together and think about all the things um, that we've lost, which I think is important to do. It's important to recognize how tough this is uh, in the collective global world, but also start thinking a bit about some of the silver linings. You know, every loss to me is an opportunity to reflect and, uh, and an opportunity to start thinking about what really matters to you, both in terms of um, your everyday lives, but in terms of how you want to spend the rest of your lives. And for me, this pandemic has really brought that question to the forefront for all of us. So I'm hoping that as we confront some of the challenges we faced, we are going to, and I know this is going to be exercise which sometimes might require us to squint and look deeper, look at every single silver lining that we saw in the pandemic. And make sure that silver lining isn't just going to remain a lining, but becomes a central part of our strategy moving forward. And in many ways, I feel where CID, where the Wiener Center, where the Kennedy School, where Harvard can fit in, is to reflect on those silver linings to help nurture them and grow them. It's not as if we went into the pandemic looking like, job well done, let's go home. We went into the pandemic with many, many deep issues. Uh, I'm hoping that we will leave the pandemic. I'm hoping when 30 years later, some of us who are lucky enough to still be around will reflect on I keep thinking when my grandchild, I hope to see my grandchild one day, uh, will ask me, Granddad, what did you do in the year 2020? Uh, I will have something powerful to say for no other reason just to look good in front of my grandchild's eyes. I feel like that's a worthy cause for me. But, but I mean that seriously. This is a moment that could be a legacy moment for a lot of us, uh, but only if we rise to the occasion. Um, let me start um, uh, the, the, the show by, by, by acknowledging one other thing. You know, it's kept me up uh, at night often, which is we're doing a conference on inequality, and yet we in the room represent some of the most influential people in the room. And it's, it's sort of nagged at me throughout uh, to say, are we being somewhat weird about this? And, and I can't fully address that today, but we're beginning to address it. So I wanted to start with, uh, in addition to my voice, um, the voices of people who we think we're trying to help. So just to give you a, uh, a background of what we did is, um, with the pandemic, it's been hard. Um, we started working with a group called Aspire, which is a, a group which came out of Harvard, which is a group of faculty who were engaging with first-gen college students across the world. It started more in the Middle East and Africa, and now it's expanded to several thousand people. Um, we did a survey of all of these individuals. Uh, on your table, you will see a... Uh, um, um, a QR code, which I'll come to in a second, but next to the QR code, you'll see a bunch of what looks like a word cloud. 
This word cloud is a response from about three and a half thousand of our first gen students we've engaged with where we pose the question to them uh, about what are the key themes. It should be, uh, Sarah, it should be on every table, or where is it? Sarah, is, it's that one. Um, if you see this word cloud, this is what is front of mind to uh, these individuals who for the first time in their families have started college. What I'm also gonna do is, um, in the initial plan, we were not gonna share their ideas. We were gonna actually share their voices, which I'm going to do virtually, and we were gonna invite several of them to actually be part of the event. That third part hasn't happened because it was impossible to arrange visas in light of what's happening in the world, but I'm hoping this will be a consistent theme for us, that when we meet together, not only will you see gems that I'm seeing in the room, all of you who've accomplished tremendously, but we get to see gems in the making as well. We get to see individuals who uh, come to Harvard, and this is the first time they've been in a gathering like this, and you get to see their stories uh, uh, and hopefully be inspired by them and inspire them. Uh, and um, so, so Claire, if we could start and then um, we'll do the show. So this is just short snippets of what they're saying. We asked them the question, what does inequality mean to you? And this is just a very short sense of what inequality means to, to some of them. Inequality to me is not being able to realize your full potential because of an unequal distribution of opportunities. It's a restricted freedom. It is all the broken dreams of deprived opportunities. It's not having the same opportunity to get a promotion as someone else. Education inequality for such a trace new person does come to such difference. Lack of similar opportunities. And the resources needed to be able to reach one's um, potential. It's the lack of social justice. And depriving the girl child access to education just because she's a girl. Inequality for me is not being given a chance to dream. This is just a short reflection, just a reminder to us about these are individuals who are telling their stories and they start from the lack of opportunities to literally the opportunity to dream. And that last one really got to me because I was like, gosh, I thought dreams were free and dreams were cheap, but they're not. Uh, dreams are also circumscribed by the circumstances we're in. So I want to make sure we keep these voices as short and abridged as they were in how we reflect on, on what we're doing. And in the same spirit, I wanted to be very clear. Look, another thing we were, I was having lunch with uh, some of my colleagues here and I said, look, um, the structure of these panels tends to be there's panelists and there's audience. And that immediately, that little foot and a half of a dais creates an inequality in our conversation. You shouldn't feel that way. None of our panelists feel that way. Um, we want these, our panelists are simply here as conversation starters, uh, but we want each of you to feel like a panelist, if that's a word, so you come into our conversations. Um, and that's gonna happen in structured ways, in the conversations we have after the panel, during the panel. Um, so feel free to use this. They're, they're very interesting people on your tables. Uh, please talk to them. We're creating breaks throughout the day precisely for that purpose. So I know sometimes it's awkward to introduce yourself to someone you don't know, but if it, if it helps, I'm giving you the, if I could give a little pass to say, here's a pass you can give to someone to say, this is a conversation opener, please use that. In particular on some of your tables, and we'll see more and more of this, we have students from Harvard. Uh, one of the most special places at Harvard is our students. They come from all sorts of amazing places. CID has a student ambassador program. Uh, you're going to experience them on our tables today and at dinner tonight you're going to hear them again uh, use this opportunity to get to talk to a student if they're on their table uh, they're also by the way great uh, guides to harvard so if you have questions about harvard this is a great chance uh, to talk to them as well we want to showcase what we think is our best talent on your tables as well and guess what it's not just our faculty it's our students. Uh, and so we, w I hope you get a chance to, 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 to get to talk to them. Um, let me end by doing something which we typically do at the end, which is you end these things by thanking people. I don't want to do it at the end. I want to do it at the start. Because the problem with thanking people at the end is you've left. And I want to make sure what I said is if there's something goes wrong, blame me. But if something goes right, I want you to know who are the faces you should be thanking when you're enjoying something. And so the two most important people who really carried the show are Sarah, who's sitting right there. Uh, and Claire, who's sitting at the back. Um, and I want to make sure, uh, again, when something is going wrong, approach me. When things are good, uh, th those are the two you want to reach out to. Adriana, who is CID's Director of Strategy and Development, um, who's sitting on the table here. Um, 
know where Rosemary is, but Rosemary is usually uh, hiding somewhere. Where is Rosemary? She is, she's, uh, uh, she's at the registration table. Um, also outside, if you see, there's lots of uh, folks standing there as well. The little pamphlets, those are some amazing programs within CID about work that is going on. So feel free to talk to them. They're there to talk to you. Uh, they're not just there to stare at pieces of paper. They welcome conversations with you. So please approach them, have conversations with them as well. Um, uh, and then I'm really grateful to the scientific committee which set up this, uh, this event. Um, that is uh, my own colleague, Danny, where Danny's gonna set us in the first panel. Danny's right there. Um, Danny Roderick uh, um, and Marcella Alsan. CID is very much spread over. So these were two faculty from the Kennedy School. Uh, we have Peter Blair from the Graduate School of Education, uh, who was really a part of our committee as well. Um, and Rafaela Sadun, who happens to be at the moment in Italy. She was trying to come back, couldn't make it back in time, but she's sending you her best wishes from the business school. Um, so with that, uh, I'm gonna hand over to Danny uh, to start the first panel, but thank you again for sharing your time with us today. afternoon everybody um, let me add my word of, of welcome as well and before I do anything I just want to say that that awesome uh, from whom you just heard has been a, 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 um, very very modest uh, um, I, I know um, how hard he has worked and how much effort has gone uh, into organizing this whole thing so um, he was very generous with his thanks but I think um, I, I, I want to be the first to thank awesome uh, directly for for his leadership. Um, in fact, he's responsible why I'm running this session. Uh, when we had a discussion about uh, what kind of sessions we should, we should have in this event, um, one of the first things that we decided was to have a session on the politics uh, of, of inequality, and that was great. Um, I thought my contribution was done. And then he said, um, you have to moderate the session. I said, I'm <laughs> just an economist. Um, I don't know much about politics. Then he said, but you can choose the three people you want to be on that panel. Um, I said, I can choose anybody I want, anybody you want. So you have my dream team of uh, people to, um, that I want to hear from, and I think um, you'll be delighted to hear from uh, on this topic, the politics of, of, of inequality. Um, we have uh, Jacob Hacker from uh, Yale, um, uh, Alicia Holland, uh, my colleague here in the government department, and Pratap Mehta, who's um, a visiting professor at Princeton, also senior fellow in India's um, Centers for Policy Research. Um, so our topic is, is inequality. I think it's, it's a truism to say that uh, we, we live <coughs> in a world of great inequality, but that doesn't make it any less significant or, or urgent. Um, we have uh, gone through a period where inequality um, has risen uh, in most of the advanced world, and even where it has not, um, uh, there has been significant fissures and cleavages opened up. There's a great sense of economic insecurity, uh, precarity, disconnectedness on the part of many people uh, from the elites. Um, and um, it, it, it seems hard to believe that there was a time when um, many people, including uh, uh, critically economists, would, did not want to talk about uh, inequality. They thought inequality was not a subject that should really concern us. Uh, we might be concerned about poverty, of course, the, the people at the very bottom. Uh, we want to do something about that. We might be concerned about um, overall economic growth and, and overall size of the pie and productivity. Uh, <coughs> but inequality was not a subject that was really central uh, for, us, for us to study. Of course, those days are, are very much gone. I think we now uh, all understand that uh, inequality not only creates serious economic problems, but it also damages our society, damages uh, our polities and our politics, and especially, especially that last bit uh, that we want to focus on in this conversation. So the first question is, 
um, how does inequality affect our politics? Now, there are interesting paradoxes there, because on the one hand, you might think that rising inequality uh, would have sort of um, uh, created more class-based politics, more demands for redistribution, should have strengthened the left in the political spectrum. But of course, what we've seen much more predominant in most countries has been the rise of an authoritarian right, uh, a, a populist authoritarianism of the right. Um, so we want to ask the question, how is this possible? Um, and how, does, how exactly does inequality affect the quality of our democracy? Second question that we want to come back ask is also the question of what kind of inequality? Um, is it inequality of income? Uh, if it is income, is it inequality at the very top that matters, the top 1%? Is it inequality at the very bottom, how the very poor are doing that matters? Or is it inequality in the center, that is the middle class, the squeeze on the middle class? Is that really what matters for politics? Maybe it's not about income. Maybe it's about inequality of wealth. Maybe it's inequality of access to public services. Maybe it's about fairness and dignity rather than uh, any of those economic matters. And third, I hope we can turn also to um, reversing the error. Uh, that is, not simply ask the question of how does inequality affect our politics, but how does our politics affect inequality? After all, inequality doesn't fall from the sky you know, ready-made as an exogenous force. Um, it's a product of our choices, it's a product of our politics, uh, and therefore we want to ask um, not only the question of what we can do, uh, but also um, what has gone wrong with our politics um, that has uh, delayed uh, the kind of response. Um, that's about all that I'm going to say uh, before I turn uh, to my distinguished panel. The plan here is that I'll ask uh, each one of our uh, panelists to say something for five, six minutes. Then we'll have a bit of a discussion. Then I'm going to ask a few questions to the panelists. Then we'll open it up uh, for your questions. And then the plan is, is uh, to finish by 3.40. Okay. So with that, uh, let me start with um, um, Jacob. Well, thank you very much, and it's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, we wanted to start off on this high point of optimistic conversation by talking about the politics of inequality. But, um, but I do think you're right um, that it's been, it's striking the extent to which the conversation has changed. Not only is there much more research on inequality, but there's much more interest in the way in which democracy and inequality or politics and inequality are, are interwoven. Um, I take a particular interest in this because um, a little more than a decade ago, my co-author Paul Pearson and I wrote a book called Winner Take All Politics, um, how Washington made the rich richer and turned its back on the middle class. And it was, uh, the subtitle kind of sums up the argument. So it was an argument about how inequality was politically generated in the United States. And so um, that book got a, a bit of attention after the Occupy Wall Street protests occurred. Um, and. Uh, and we got a, a nice shout out from Bill Moyers, the veteran journalist who called us the Sherlock Holmes and Watson of political science. Um, that led jo Paul and I to spend the next 10 years arguing about who got to be Sherlock Holmes and who is Dr. Watson. But, um, and our basic <coughs> argument there, I wanna sort of start here by saying first that I'm gonna focus here on the United States as a very important case of an advanced industrial democracy, a distinctive one. Um, distinctive in, in particular in the degree to which inequality has risen and that rise has been very concentrated at the top and has resulted in relatively limited uh, trickle down benefits, if you will, to the rest of Americans. I've written also in my work about in, uh, insecurity, economic insecurity and, and the shift of risk onto workers and their families over the last generation and that's part of this story too. Um, and in, in winner take all politics, our basic argument was that inequality had been caused in important respects by public policy. And, and I want to just lay out just the sort of three basic arguments we made because I think they're very important for thinking through the, the relationship of, between inequality and politics and some of the questions that have already been uh, raised uh, about that relationship. So the first thing we said is that when you think about inequality uh, and, and politics, you really have to say what kind of inequality you're talking about. Um, and in particular, where, where in the distribution you're focusing. And so we were really focused in our work on why it is that the United States has seen this hyper-concentration of income at the very, very top, uh, which, is a, which is, again, a distinctive feature of American inequality. 
And when you start to do that, a lot of policies uh, come into view that you wouldn't otherwise look at. So the, the way in which, uh, for example, estates are taxed in the United States or, um, or not, as the case may be. Um, we also really strongly argued that the policies that affect inequality go well beyond taxes and transfers. And that's sort of where economists had focused and, and most policy, policy scholars had focused most of their attention. Instead, we focused on what I've come to call pre-distribution, the way in which government shapes the market in ways that affect the relative power and relative incomes of people across the distribution. So think about the role of policies governing unions or, uh, or policies shaping the financial market, right? And, um, and indeed, we, we put a heavy emphasis on the deregulation of finance in the United States, which essentially allowed large uh, numbers of uh, people at the very top to, to make enormous sums of money by shifting systemic risk onto the rest of America. And then finally, we, 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 we put a heavy emphasis on what, what we call drift, the way in which failure to update policy to respond to changes in society and to global shifts in the nature of the economy. Um, and those changes do include, by the way, major shifts in the, in, in the role of women in society, in the, in the demographic uh, characteristics of, uh, of rich democracies. Failure to respond to those itself is a huge influence on uh, on, on outcomes, and it has a politics of its own. Um, the, the other two things that I want to emphasize um, beyond these sort of basic points about how um, democracy or politics can, can affect inequality are that, um, that what we came to think and what we've come to really believe over the last two or, two or three years is that the rise in inequality in the United States foretold and, and, just, and sort of summarized a huge decline in the quality of democracy in the United States. And, and it's very basic level, what we've seen is a shift in the balance of power away from ordinary middle class Americans. And in a democracy, right, everyone is supposed to have an equal potential to influence what government does. In our democracy, we argued more and more uh, money was uh, had outsized influence. And, and in general, in part because of extreme partisan polarization, uh, politicians weren't particularly responsive um, to ordinary Americans. And I would just say one last thing uh, and then close uh, within uh, my time limit. Um, one last thing I want to say is that I think we in our previous work really neglected um, the role of race in this story. And in our most recent book, Let Them Eat Tweets, um, which is really about how the right has, uh, has, has moved in the direction that um, Danny was, was talking about in the United States, um, we really emphasize the way in which the American Republican Party has come to embody a kind of plutocratic populist coalition, which involves a continuing commitment to policies that are very beneficial to the richest Americans and corporations, but a growing emphasis uh, on divisive racial and cultural issues and, and issues of identity. And to us, this is a huge threat um, in a way that maybe wasn't true of the first wave of, of sort of developments that we talk about. A huge threat, not just to the, you know, to the basic equality of opportunity in, and, um, and sort of the foundation of the middle class that we saw um, for, for, for years, um, but a real threat to our democracy itself and to social stability. And I'd love to talk more about that, but I want to make sure everyone has time to offer their opening remarks. So thank you so much for having me. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to, to that last where you just ended, but yeah. uh, let's, let's turn to Alicia now. Wonderful. Well, thank you again for organizing this panel and the chance to share some thoughts with you. So my research focuses on Latin America, and many times in discussions about politics and inequality, there's an alarmist tone that rising inequality is going to destabilize democracy. And coming from Latin America, that perspective always seems slightly off in part because you've seen relatively stable democracy in a region with very high levels of economic inequality for the past decades. And at the same point, what actually has often been destabilizing, perversely, have been efforts to reduce income inequality. So I want to expand on those points a little bit, both how you can have stable democracy with high levels of inequality, and then turn to how reductions in inequality can themselves be destabilizing. So on the first point, many political scientists, as Danny mentioned, tend to think that in a democracy, as inequality rises or has been a persistent problem, you're going to have people clamor for greater social policies to reduce inequality. 
And yet, empirically, what we see is that often isn't the case. So in contexts of high inequality, you often see people disengage from politics. They have what I call a process of diminished expectations. They expect less and less out of their political and economic system. And that often comes from their experience of social policies that don't reach them, of government officials who perhaps don't listen to their interests. And so they see the political system as unable to address their demands and therefore are relatively disengaged and aren't voting for the sort of leftist parties or radical policies that we might think would help to reduce inequalities. Now that second piece of stabilizing an unequal democracy has to do with politicians and how campaigns work in unequal democracies. So you might think, well, a smart politician is going to see in an unequal society there are lots of voters that could use social policies that actually reduce these inequalities, that have a captive audience. And to a certain extent, that's true in Latin America. You've seen many what we might call political entrepreneurs create things like conditional cash transfer programs that give cash payments to low-income groups that have been quite electorally popular. But I call these easy forms of redistribution because you generally see these programs layered on top of an economic system that in important areas like antitrust or tax policy continue to favor the groups of donors and elites that sustain most politicians' campaigns. So you can have sort of short-term social policies that are reducing inequality but really aren't touching the power balance in society. So those are two mechanisms, sort of diminished expectations on the part of the electorate and then sort of easy attempts to promote greater inclusion that don't touch power relations that lead to democracies that are often relatively stable, but pretty low quality. Now, how could efforts to actually reduce inequality themselves be destabilizing? Here I just want to highlight two main channels. Well, so the first is that many attempts to reduce particularly economic inequalities have been undertaken by what are seen as technocratic elites trained at institutions like the Kennedy School, <laughs> which often is precisely what generates popular backlash and a sense that you know, the people in power really are disconnected and uninterested in the opinions of the majority of people. And so in that sense, I'd say you know, to Danny's point of what type of inequality are we talking about, many times inequalities in citizenship, inequalities in voice, inequalities in participation are far more important than the economic differences that we often focus on. And to make kind of highlight this point, if I take you back to 2010 and compare two radically different countries, Chile and Venezuela, most people in this room would look at Chile and have said, wow, here's a country where the government is really soundly administering the economy, the country's growing, inequality statistics are going down, and yet approval for democracy in Chile at the time was 45%. That's approval of the democratic system, not the president in the power, um, and then if I take you to Venezuela in the same year when Hugo Chavez was still in government but the economy was starting to tank, inequality had basically stagnated, everybody would look at Venezuela and say, what a basket case. And yet approval of democracy, not support for Chavez, approval of democracy was over 90%. And most political scientists look at those cases and say it is not about economic management, it's about the sense of who is taking those economic decisions. And Chavez was very astute politically at saying we need to involve more people in the political process. We need to create community organizations. We need to bring different faces into government. So as misguided as his economic policies were, he understood that inequality in participation was causing democratic discontent. Now the second way that I think inequality reduction efforts can often backfire is through the creation and expansion of the middle class. So to go to Danny's point, it often really is the growth of the middle class that leads to greater demands for economic inclusion. And we see this in Latin America in the past few years in that some of the cases where we've seen large scale protests, so Chile, Colombia, Brazil, all of these cases were ones where finally it felt like people at the bottom 
had a taste of what it meant to be part of the middle class. And as the pandemic started to take away some of those economic opportunities, some of the past to improve the lives of their children, that's when people really started to say, the system is rigged, there's nowhere else for us to go, we're going to take to the streets. So that's just a snapshot of how I think, at least in Latin America, inequality has been compatible with kind of low quality democracy for some period of time. And yet technocratic efforts to reduce inequality and also their success in creating a middle class have in some cases started to really break open those democratic systems and either lead to the election of populists or to protest movements that have been quite destabilizing to traditional political parties and politics. So I'll leave it there and thanks again for letting me be part of this conversation. Thank you, thank you, Alicia. Um, um, it's a great privilege to be here. Um, so, in a way, the story I'm going to say in the next five to seven minutes actually builds on the last two. And actually, I think there's a, there's a pretty, I think, I think, coherent set of patterns emerging here. Uh, the India I moved back to, we assumed, was going to be broadly liberal democratic, had hit high growth rates. We were more concerned about poverty alleviation than inequality. Uh, there was optimism that it would move from crony capitalism to well-regulated capitalism in some senses, M low to moderate state capacity, and a pluralistic open society. Fast forward now, moderate growth, deeply authoritarian, highly majoritarian, highly crony capitalist, deeply unequal, much higher state capacity, is this combination, right, actually a stable one? And is, does, does this have kind of, you know, deep economic roots? Now, what I want to suggest, I think, building on in a sense, I think, I think Alicia's point and, and Jacob's point in, in, in some ways, is that one, I actually don't think in economic equality translates into political discontent directly. If that had been historically the case, you would not have had the kinds of inequalities that has characterized pretty much every political regime in the world, except for few golden moments of social democracy. Right? Politics is a generative enterprise. And I think we should, in a sense, reverse the question. It's a miracle, actually, that, that inequality actually translates into a left politics of social democracy. That's, that's, I think, just the first kind of provocation, right? I think the second thing I want to sort of lay on the table in some sense, and, and this is maybe conditioned by the Indian case. So if you, says, okay, if you ask the question, what makes this second amalgam that I talked about, authoritarianism, majoritarianism, in the face of high inequality stable? One simple story could be that what does the state do? At the bottom end, it has managed to create, at a low level of threshold, a fairly stable and incrementally increasing stable net. Distribution without redistribution, as Alicia pointed out. So if India, you can look at modest cash transfers, you can look at uh, the National Employment Guarantee Scheme, uh, and during the pandemic, for example, you know, whatever else the government might have failed on, it actually did get the distribution of food broadly right under the PDS. So there's a kind of floor it has set which provides stability. The top 20 to 30 percent, which is the beneficiaries of the financialization of the economy, and two names, Adani and Ambani, which are not irrelevant to the story jump to mind, actually have done fabulously well. The top end of the salaried class in India has done fabulously well, right? Uh, it's being increasingly revealed in income tax returns. So, and that creates an elite cohesion around this current model. Farmers and agriculture, their political objective is in a sense largely a defensive one, as we saw in the farmers movement. So long as you're not creating a new regime that net net takes away our current subsidies, right? You're broadly in a sense okay. So who is the potentially discontented constituency here? It's usually, in a sense, the lower middle class or the upper end of the informal sector, which is also the class that was probably the most hit by not just COVID, but the shocks that preceded it, like demonetization and GST. Right? 
Now, what is their crisis of redistribution? Their crisis is essentially the, uh, the lack of productive employment and good jobs. Uh, the fact of the matter is that there isn't a political economic story that any political party in India has been able to articulate that specifically addresses that jobs crisis in a way in which can rally this constituency around a program. So in some senses, this constituency's only political alternative is, a, as Alicia says, which is Either it can reflect in political alienation and, and, and political pathology, or it can get reflected in another form of empowerment where your self-esteem right, is, in a sense, manifest through uh, some kind of ethnic or majoritarian political program. Right? So when you see pictures of mobs supported by the ruling party in India, Right, storming different sites. Just look at those pictures. They're all lower middle class young men, right? For whom the source of political empowerment now is participation in a political project where they at least have the satisfaction of saying they are better than somebody else, they are more secure than somebody else, and at least they can beat up on somebody else. So what I want to say is that all these different elements that I ho outlined, majoritarianism, strong state authoritarianism, right? economic inequality, they are actually connected to each other in a self-reinforcing equilibrium. And my worry is that it is, in fact, a quite a stable equilibrium. It's not just that moderate growth will translate into protest. The last and final point I just want to make, uh, so why do we worry about inequality politically, apart from its intrinsic uh, challenges from the point of view of justice? Because it erodes the quality of democracy. It erodes the quality of democracy by breaking one social contract of a liberal society that economic power should not automatically translate into cultural power or social power, right? That's liberalism and the art of separation. And those are the conditions under which typically economic equality has been tolerated. What is interesting about the current conjuncture is not only is the very top breaking that social contract, right? So if you think of India, the problem is not just crony capitalism and rich at the high end for all the reasons that, you know, all the through all the mechanisms that Jacob articulated through the financialization of the system, through the banking system. It is that there is an alliance between that capital and the creation of an information order in society, right? Control of media, one very striking example. Uh, influence on social media, another striking example. Where you had an unprecedented situation, and I think this is what's different from India in India now than, say, 15, 20 years ago, where capital was quite content to perform its defensive role. Now it is being enlisted in a state project of an offensive role where a state capital alliance tries to control the information order to, in a sense, you might say, strengthen the ideological and cultural underpinnings of this amalgamation of authoritarianism, majoritarianism, and inequality that I just talked about. Thank you. Thank you, Pratap. Um, so, uh, it's it's quite clear from uh, by listening to to our panelists that that if we thought there was a a, a a straightforward formulaic relationship between inequality and its political outcomes, uh, that, um, that 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 something like that does not exist. And I want to probe a little bit more uh, because you know we have such a uh, interesting variety of cases that. Um, Cases like India and, and the United States where inequality has risen, particularly at the top, um, and um, the quality of democracy has become degraded. In Latin America, if anything, inequality is actually, inequality is very high, but uh, in countries like Chile, as uh, that Alicia mentioned, um, inequality has actually fallen 
uh, in fact, quite significantly until very recently. And yet we've had uh, you know, dem democracies become destabilized. Um, and we also have the, 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 um, the uh, variation in the types of degradation of uh, democracy that we have. I mean, we have authoritarian populisms of the right as well as authoritarian populisms of the left. In the case of Latin America, the initial response uh, has been mostly um, on the left, or the, the, the populist backlash has taken mostly of a left-wing kind, of Chavez being, of course, uh, the earliest and most significant uh, example. Whereas in, in India and the United States, we see much more a kind of a right-wing ethno-nationalist uh, version of this. Um, so, 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 so I want to try to probe these differences a little bit more. I think, Jacob, your story was mostly a kind of a you know, supply side story of politics. So as an economist, I think about the demand side of politics and the supply side of politics. So the demand side is sort of, you know, what are, you know, what are the resentments? What are the people, what do people want? You know, what are they pushing for? And then the supply is what are the, what are the elites and parties offering to give them? And I heard from you largely a kind of a supply sto side story. Um, Alicia, I think you gave both a demand and a supply side story. And, Perhaps yours was actually more of a demand side story. You, you, you pointed to these lower middle classes and large mass of informal group of workers who want good jobs, can't find them, and then they, they find expression uh, in a kind of an ethno-nationalist narrative. Um, but is, 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 so maybe this might also be a prompt for you to continue the story about the, the, the let yes. them eat tweets right. argument, which I would like you to, to, to elaborate on. Well, first of all, I, I had no idea there were so many uh, parallels um, between the Indian and American cases, and that was fascinating. Um, and and I, I do think that there, it's really important to understand that uh, tackling inequality, particularly, you know, tackling um, status inequality, right, um, is can be deeply destabilizing. Which doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, but it does mean we have to understand the risks and and the challenges. Uh, I think a big part of what's happening in the U.S., and that will get me to the Let Them Eat Tweets point, is that historically marginalized groups are um, being brought more fully into the American promise, and that is creating an enormous amount of backlash. Um, now, to, to, to switch back to the supply side, I'm very strongly of, uh, believe that two things are really fundamental in these stories. One is organization, right? Um, voters are, 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 when voters are kind of atomized agents, they're not that powerful. Um, when they are organized, they are. And the balance of organization between different parts of society matters enormously, right? So the story of the shift towards a kind of winner-take-all politics was partly the story of the, of the organization, the increasing organization of capital and the rich in American politics and the decline of a lot of the organizations that once represented Americans uh, pretty well in politics like labor unions. Um, and I think the, um, the other thing we always have to keep in mind is that uh, elites matter enormously. And in the US, that may be distinctively so for, for a simple reason. We've seen increasingly nationalized and polarized political parties. And one effect of that is that um, policy bundles are being offered to voters, right, by elites, right? You do not get to choose the party that has, that combines uh, racial resentment and per, you know, massively progressive redistribution in the United States. That party does not exist, right? So um, that may be the party, as uh, I think Trump's ability to outflank his opponents in the primaries in 2016, that many of the, uh, what we're gonna call from now on the uh, lower LMCs, the lower middle class voters, would want, right? Many of those, and I should mention here that I think the geographic spatial inequalities here, the fact that many of these voters are also in places that are declining, even if they themselves are relatively privileged, is very important. But they do not get, they have to choose. And so when you have that kind of agenda setting power for parties and party elites, right, the themes that they bring together, the, the alliances they try to build matter enormously. And so <coughs> building on the work of Dan, uh, Daniel Ziblatt, uh, we really argue in Let Them Eat Tweets that the Republican Party faced this kind of fundamental conservative dilemma. It had to decide whether as its voting base became less affluent uh, and it re relying more and more on essentially white working class voters, 
whether or not it was going to moderate its economic stances or radicalize its identity appeals. And we all know which direction it went. There were real choices along the way, real moments when the party really faced internal dissension over whether it was going to be a party that sort of went with the ethnic entrepreneurs, but it ultimately did. And that seems like a pretty baked-in feature of the party today. And that has gone hand-in-hand, though, with a continuing commitment to really regressive policies. And so I'll just say, if you look at the Republican Party and think of it as a right-wing populist party, it is almost impossible to understand why the two biggest priorities of the Republican Party in 2017 were tax cuts for rich people and corporations, one, and two, repealing and replacing the Affordable Care Act, which would have devastated many of the communities that voted for the Republicans. And so I think it's really important to keep in mind that this is a very distinctive hybrid of sort of right-wing populism and a kind of almost sort of hyper-libertarian conservatism that is very skeptical of government and redistribution. And it is, unfortunately, I think a fairly stable equilibrium for the Republican Party, though it is becoming, I think, a very unstable source of great instability in the American political system. So my puzzle, Jacob, in the American story, and as you lay it out, is you have the Republican Party who faced with this challenge of essentially being the party of the affluent but losing its base more and more due to rising inequality, then decides to respond to it by not giving up on its pro-affluent policies but increasingly channeling white resentment and sort of going on identity politics. That explains very well, I think, the Republican Party. What the hell is going on with the left? What is the Democratic Party doing while all of this is happening and why we haven't seen an even more powerful repositioning by the Democratic Party until maybe the last election? And obviously I want to hear what my other panelists think on these questions, but let me say two things very quickly. So whenever you, since I am Sherlock Holmes, right, of course I am Sherlock Holmes. I have to think about motive and means, right? And so motive, right, for holding on is the continuing sway of the deepest pocketed supporters of the Republican Party, right? And, you know, again, there are tensions in that relationship and they've grown, but that, I think, is why they want to hold on to these inegalitarian policies. The means has to do with the fact that there was this other dimension of identity that they could appeal to, and a lot of organizations from right-wing media to the National Rifle Association to the evangelical movement that facilitated those strategies. The last thing I would say here is that this is not a, so I said it was a stable equilibrium. It's only so because of the capacity of the Republican Party to pursue essentially a minoritarian strategy, right? This is not a strategy that's bent on capturing 55% of the popular vote, right? It's a strategy that's bent on getting as close as possible to a majority and benefiting from all of the features of the American political system we know about that magnify the influence of the party that has support from those living in less sparsely populated regions. And so that, I think, is almost impossible to overstate as a reason why this is possible, that this has happened. Remember, no electoral college, no Donald Trump, right? The last Republican president to receive a majority of the popular vote was George W. Bush in 2004, right? The Supreme Court would not be 6-3 conservative majority were it not for these biases. The Senate is so stacked that Republicans have literally not won the popular vote in any six-year election cycle in the Senate for over 20 years. And yet, as we know, they've held that body for a number of that, a large portion of that period. So to me, that is a deeply enabling feature of this. And I want to stop because I want to hear what others have to say. So I hope that helps answer the question of why this has occurred and why it's been viable. And I'm sure there's parallels to other countries. So we might come back. So Alicia, in Latin America, we have, again, a populism of the left that is a response to these sense of citizen sort of estrangement, right, from public life. So what would you attribute that? 
Yeah, so Latin America has both what I would call inclusionary populism, so those are leaders on the left who usually are making claims that they represent a broader view of the populace that historically had been included in politics. So that's like Hugo Chavez in Venezuela that we talked about, but also Evo Morales in Bolivia who's trying to include indigenous groups. Um, and that partially is about you know groups that genuinely hadn't had a stake in political power, but I'd also attribute it to the structure of social welfare states in Latin America, and I would also oddly include the American case here, because most welfare states were structured around employment. So if you had a good job, you had a pension and healthcare coverage that was reasonable, but if you worked in the informal sector or had sort of precarious gig employment, um, you, you basically had no access or to pretty you know, cheap forms of redistribution that they call including the transfer programs, and there was a segment that was left out that economically was often doing okay, but they weren't poor enough to get the sort of cash payments, and they weren't rich enough and in stable enough jobs to be part of the contributory system. And that is the core basis of support for inclusionary or left-wing populists. And honestly, I think that, you know, in terms of Bernie and some of the appeal of left-wing populists in the US, is targeting a similar <laughs> Targeting a similar segment of, of what we're calling a kind of lower middle class or sort of precarious middle class um, that really has seen the quality of employment decline pretty dramatically and therefore their social benefits that often are linked to a job also are much worse in some cases. Now we also are seeing exclusionary populism in Latin America. So these are politicians like Bolsonaro in Brazil or Bukele in El Salvador. And here it's slightly different than the, the far right um, populism that you see in Europe and that a lot of it is tied to crime. And one connection that is pretty strong empirically is between inequality and rising crime. And I think that is a channel that often can breed right-wing populism as people say, you know, we just want a quick, you know, hard hand against crime that then empowers a much more authoritarian approach. But the other thing, going back to how the, the structure of the welfare state can shape the type of populism that emerges, is then you know, in many more European cases where there was a generous welfare state, when you then have the entrance of new groups, obviously new immigrant groups are at the, the heart of a lot of this in Europe, that's what then sort of starts to threaten what's a pretty generous welfare state where people start to feel some of these um, <coughs> sense of status um, anxiety, you know, will there be enough benefits for me? Why am I paying for these people who aren't, shouldn't be part of our political system? And so that's where exclusionary populists often are about redrawing the boundaries of who's a citizen to be more exclusive, to say we don't want immigrants. And in the case of Latin America, we don't want criminals. We should just kill them all rather than due process and all of these niceties. So social welfare systems, I think, can really condition the type of populism that ends up emerging. And that's a big part of why we see in Latin America you know, real questions about how the social system has been designed and the people who have been left out of it leading to these left-wing populist movements. So what, what, let me ask you a question about uh, sort of, um, Chile and the future of the region. The, I mean, Chile has been a bellwether in some sense, or a leader um, in, in it, was a, it was a leader in the turn towards um, market conservatism, uh, uh, and also back towards democracy um, uh, in the late 80s and, 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 uh, and, and the recreation of the social um, uh, welfare um, arrangements and transfers and so forth. And, and it's also now we have a new government there that's um, uh, a, a government of the one point kind of populist left, but without the kind of explicit anti, without the explicit majoritarian um, uh, outlook on politics um, uh, that is not, doesn't seem to threaten democratic norms, at least at the outset. You know, one question is whether you agree with that. The other is whether you think that's the beginning of something new in the region, um, whether it's something that the rest of the region might, um, might emulate. Mm -hmm. I mean, you certainly have cases in the region where, you know, uh, a, a popular left has observed democratic norms. If you think of, you know, I think Boric 
takes a lot of inspiration from Brazil and the workers' party. So in that sense, it doesn't have to be a threat to sort of liberal democratic norms. I think the more interesting tension emerging out of Chile is what I might call a cleavage between a red and a green left. And when you think of the left starting to sort of kill itself and sort of fight with itself, that's one of the big tensions that you see in Chile, but also you could find it in Ecuador or Mexico and to a certain extent in the US as well, which is that in the pursuit of redistributive policies, which was the focus of you know, people like Boric historically or you know, more social democratic forces, they're also contending with demands often from younger segments of the electorate to take in Latin America, and it's really expressed as anti-mining policies that have been at the core of how Chile sustained its economic model, which was, you know, well, we'll make a lot of money from copper that we can then use to redistribute through social programs. But once you have a more green left that's really questioning, should we make our money that way? Maybe we need to question the whole development model. Suddenly, the sort of red left or traditional social democratic left that was saying, well, let's just redistribute a bigger pie is really um, is, is caught in a bind of how you're going to fund that system without you know, much more fundamental taxation. So I think a lot of the initial hopes for Boric have been started to um, fade in part because he's getting, getting caught in a lot of battles between what I see as a sort of red versus green left that we're going to see playing out, I think, in a lot of developing and developed countries in the years to come. I hope you're all thinking of, of uh, your questions and comments that you want to, to contribute because we'll turn to the audience in a few minutes. But before that, Prada, I'm sure there are many things you've heard that you want to reflect on. But uh, my, my own um, question to you sort of would be the, sort of the India version of the question I asked uh, Jacob because it's about um, the role of um, you, you mentioned that, that um, the, the lower middle classes and, 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 and the informal sector workers um, feeling this economic um, uh, uh, stress of, of not uh, adequate jobs and, and then um, and, and their resentments uh, essentially get channeled through Modi and, and, and his ethno-nationalism. So the question is, why is Congress party? And you said there was no politics of you know, providing the economic uh, uh, an adequate economic response, but the question is, is why not? I mean, why wasn't there a supply from the Congress party or the, uh, any other kind of um, uh, political party of, a, of an economic strategy that actually uh, directly responds to these economic anxieties um, and preventing them being channeled through a kind of a right-wing populism? Uh, thanks. Great uh, question. Um, so a couple of thoughts. One, I think I just want to kind of clarify one thing that, you know, when I spoke of sort of the lower middle class as the base, I actually didn't mean to just imply that that's the class the BJP is mobilizing for its uh, Hindu nationalist agenda. It is very much an elite project, and there is increasingly elite consensus around it. That's, in a sense, the foot soldiers. That's the social energy. Um, and I and 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 so I so I just want to kind of I think I think I think just kind of clarify to make that clear. Now, I think a couple of things. One, in India, I think the left-right distinction doesn't kind of map off political parties in quite the same way or as easily. So, in two dimensions, that distinction is easier to make. Uh, you might say state authoritarianism and an approach to pluralism. That's often what we mean by right, right, on cultural issues. On economics, one, historically it has been the case that the right has often found it easier to triangulate even on social welfare. Think of Bismarck, right, going back to the 19th century, when the political opportunity arises. And actually the BJP has, in a sense, been just that. The very schemes that it fought the election against, uh, national rural employment guarantee against it, appropriated in some senses at its, as it, at its own. The second, I think, important thing about this inclusion-exclusion dimension, uh, which is, and, and that is the BJP's biggest strength, which is that for years, in some senses, the Congress liberal establishment uh, suffered from one being the establishment. And what comes as a consequence of being the establishment 
is that you have no social movement attached to you. Right? I think one of the most important lessons of right-wing populism and right-wing success across countries in recent years is they operated with a generative conception of politics. Political identities are made, they're not given. The left operated with a deterministic conception of politics. Well, we have all these class cleavages, we have all this caste cleavages, we have all these demographics on our side. What could possibly go wrong, right? It was, there was a kind of fatalism. Whereas the right said, look, this is how institutional power actually works. In the US case, this is how you can deploy the US Constitution. Uh, you had the creation of civil society groups that played for the long haul. Politics is about as much about identity and identification as it is about immediate material interests. And one commonality between India and the US is, I mean, you think of organizations like the RSS, which have been playing around for you know, decades in some senses, that they actually shifted the cultural and economic common sense far more, I think, effectively. There is no left equivalent. Even today, there is no left or centrist outreach. I mean, even in, during election times, Congress party does not come and quote us vote in person in the way in which the BJP does. That's the, that's the one truth about this. So I think that old fashioned sense that politics in a sense is about engagement uh, you know, in ways that allow for a long-term shift in common sense. I think that's very much been the hallmark of, I think, the right. Uh, the standard case since the 1930s is, of course, the center and left are always divided. Uh, so yes, technically, you can still get more than 50% of the votes to, BJ, mm -hmm. to, to defeat the BJP, but there is no political configuration under which you can uh, see that happening. So I actually do think there is a kind of almost kind of intellectual mistake in the center left, which is we were victims of our own, I think, political determinism. That was our habit of thinking about Indian politics. There, there are enough caste cleavages. Given these cross-cutting cleavages, no unified Hindu majoritarian identity can ever emerge. Well, actually, you know, that was sociological determinism of a very self. We, the only thing we <coughs> didn't want to do was politics. Similarly, on the economic side, in some ways, I mean, I think you know, there isn't a huge difference between the BJP's economic program and the UPA's. It has appropriated some of its elements. Uh, it has exacerbated some of the crony part of the elements. I think that, that, that economic consensus in the top is actually quite uh, you know, powerful uh, in, in, you know, in, in some ways. But I think the one difference is that the UPA, in a sense, projected whatever good it did almost in a technocratic style. There was no politics attached to it. Right? And even the default common sense of intellectual life, if you were in, in Delhi, was we were all in kind of service delivery Im improvement mode, a la Kennedy School. You know, this little accountability measure here, you know, this particular um, scheme, you know, can it be improved by 10 percent, 20 percent, 30 percent? And the large agenda, right, which is what will reshape the fundamental balance of power in society, right? That space just became politically entirely vacant, right? Uh, now, I mean, the Congress Party would take a long time, but, but, but suffice it to say that sometimes ancient regimes just lose the cognitive capacity and intellectual will and, and, and will to fight. I mean, there's, there's no, there's, one can't put a stronger, I mean, it's trying to revive the Bourbon monarchy saying after the revolution, why can't it institute reform A, B, or C? Uh, I think that's, that's unfortunately the tragedy India is stuck in. Thank you. Um, so let's, let's open it up uh, for, for questions and comments. Um, so uh, uh, please briefly state your name uh, and where you're from before um, you, you ask your question. And let's try to see if we can have um, quick questions or comments so we can have as many of you as possible. Yes. Uh, so thanks. Uh, Jim Francisconi, I'm with the Advanced Leadership Institute. And it's a privilege to be here, this whole forum. And I wish I had brought your book, uh, Professor Hacker, because I just completed a course in uh, inequality in American democracy by a fan of yours and the best professor, Theda Scotchpole. 
And so the question is for you, because I just completed the, the course. And so, and uh, we read your book. We also read, I think, an article by you about the, correct me if I'm wrong, the top 20% pulling away. And so my, my question gets back to your question, sir, about the solutions, okay? Uh, your analysis, the organizational forces on the Republican Party, one solution would be suddenly Mitch Romney and Lisa Murkowski break that vice. So let's forget that solution, okay? And let's go back to the Democratic question that you were asked. So I take it to counter the economic elites that you talk about, the libertarians, you've said it several times, unions, and you said it in your book, you talk about the organized forces that weaken unions. So on the Democratic side, if you could address the counter, whether it's Democrats or some other party, that to, how does you counter economic elites in a, in a way that lessens uh, polarization and preserves American democracy, which is at risk, and then also whether it's caused by the economic elites and there may be some disagreement or whether it bubbles up, how do you counter the white ethno-nationalists that have aligned? How is that done in a way? Is it rural America? Is it, how do you build that to preserve our democracy? Before you answer, I will allow two-handers, uh, just to say that if you have a question that's very closely related to the question that's just been posed, so you have, you're at liberty to raise two hands, but the second question has to be about a third as long as the first one. That's the condition. Very quickly. Uh, my understanding is that the Democratic Party and Very quickly, my name is Mandla. I'm a graduating MPA, mid-career MPA student here at the Kennedy School. Uh, just to all of the panelists, are there models of organization on the left other than unions? You know, how do we basically create models that can counter this kind of nationalism, which is a common threat? Thank you. Great. Another two handers on this? OK, gone. Good. Jake, right. Jake, why don't you start? Yeah, this is just a small question about how to save American democracy. Um, <laughs> But a, great, but a great question, and, and actually contained a lot of the answer in it. So, so let me just say, because I didn't address the question of the Democrats, um, and it wasn't, I wasn't trying to avoid it. Um, I just wanted to make sure I made clear my argument about what had happened in terms of the sort of activation of racial animus. Um, that, you know, compared with mainstream parties of the left in other countries, the U.S. Democ Democrats have actually done pretty well in the sense they haven't, they haven't you know, a lot of those parties have been wiped out. And Democrats are, you know, as I said, the flip side of the Republicans having lost the popular vote in you know, every presidential election since 2004 is that Democrats have won the popular vote. And if we had a kind of purely majoritarian system, uh, both a majoritarian electoral system and a majoritarian um, uh, Congress, <laughs> you know, without a Senate filibuster, they certainly would be much more advantaged than they are today. Um, that said, I mean, I think the Republican Party would have changed its stances on some key issues as a result. Um, and, and so we have gotten to this unpleasant place where essentially the two parties are very, very close to parity and the floor is very high for both of them. Um, the Democratic Party, I think, has undermined itself or its leaders have undermined the party in a number of ways. Um, as we wrote about in Winner Take All Politics, right, the party was not as much in thrall of the newly organized corporate and financial elite, but it was uh, definitely along for the ride. And, uh, and, and more than that, was often leading, leading the charge, especially on financial deregulation. Um, and so that, and, and that's still, I mean, that, the, the, the two things that, that a lot of research suggests that were most devastating for the party outside of urban America were NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement, which not just devastated a lot of communities, devastated the party standing in those communities. And, um, and more generally, as Autor and others have written about, the, you know, the, the larger China shock. Um, and you know, the, it is a puzzle, and it fits in with our whole story here, right? That when, so the, the Autor research, I think, is super revealing, because uh, they basically find that when you get these huge trade shocks that really devastate communities, and they're just looking at sort of before and after what happens to the elected officials, right? So you either, if you're mostly white place, you elect super conservative Republicans, and if you're a diverse place, you elect liberal, you know, left Democrats. Most of these places were not very 
diverse. And so the, the net result of this huge economic shock was this weird shift in sort of in, 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 the, in a sort of larger sense of the politics and inequality. It seems like a weird shift to the Republican Party. But I think that can be understood through this use of identity appeals and the sense of the Democratic Party basically abandoned these folks. And I think that's, I think for, so I, I'm going to answer the question right now, which is I think there are two basic problems that Democrats face, right? One is that they're definitely, they definitely need political reforms. And to get those political reforms, they need effective power, right? And so, you know, it's a chicken and egg problem. But to the extent that they have the power and they're going to need more than 50 votes in the Senate, they should be pursuing some of these reforms. But there's a deeper problem, which is, I think, an organizational and ideological one, but mostly an organizational one, which is, like, what are the models, right, for organization that are going to allow them to, to have, to, to have, um, the left more broadly to have effective power, right? And so I think we've seen more protest activity, more fervor, and especially among young people on issues of social justice than at any point, certainly in my lifetime, right? I was born in the 70s, so I did not get to experience the 60s. Um, and, um, and yet uh, the organizational infrastructure for that is often very weak. And I do think there are people thinking this through, right? What does is, what is organization look like in the 21st century? But to me, that is the number one in, initiative. And by the way, this is not a Democratic Party initiative. For the most part, this has to happen, as it has happened historically, through organizations that are separate from the parties, right? Um, and I actually think there's this famous story, and I'll end with this, right? FDR is, uh, supposedly was talking to some group representatives about a policy change. He says, OK, you've convinced me. Now make me do it, right? And where are the organizations on the left that can make democratic leaders do things, right? Um, and I think this is, you know, this is the real challenge. Um, but at least we know what the challenge is. And, and I do think, I don't think demography is destiny, but I think there are favorable trends for the Democrats if we can hold on to our democracy <laughs> for the near term. And, um, but to do so, they're going to have to move beyond a lot of the risks that we've talked about, particularly the degree to which they have been uh, not willing to fight the deeper war, not willing, uh, not willing to, uh, and not willing to retreat from the kind of technocratic approach to inequality that I think is actually, as Alicia's work suggests, sometimes uh, actually inimical to the goal of uh, long-term addressing political and economic inequality. Do either one of you want to come in on this question of what the organizational basis, social basis, or ideational basis of how to respond. Um, I mean, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Alicia? I would just say very, very briefly, some positive things you see in Latin America are you know, more attention to spatial policy, like things like really supporting regional universities that aren't in capital cities, like deconcentrating power out of cities, I think, is part of the left's long-term strategy and has worked in many, many other countries. And I think also just picking up on Jacob's, you know, point about you know what is a new model of organizing a lot of that is trying to figure out how you know more participatory online forms interface with organizations and there i think places like taiwan that have really incorporated civic tech into government are are good models going forward but they're they're not traditional organizations and how they interface is is i think one of the big questions for the future i think two Quick thoughts. One, I think Jacob's right. That a lot of the pressure will have to come outside formal party structures. That's historically been the case, I think. And even one thinks of, in India, the Congress party historically. I mean, you have to kind of go back to the 1920s and 30s and think about an organizational model of mobilization in civil society. Uh, I think the second thing, which is that, you know, when you get an opportunity at power, even if it's not at the central level, just use it in a way that becomes exemplary that it actually sends the signal that you are serious on creating a kind of inclusion participatory path. Because a lot of you, because politics will give you these chances, right? I mean, it could be a provincial government. It could be a local government. And it's how you use that moment uh, in some senses to create a narrative. You know, why should I trust you? Because I have set this example. But when you can't say that I have not set, I have set this example, then almost all the kind of other mobilization activity just kind of goes around in circles, right? So exemplarity still matters in politics a lot. Yes? So this is a shift from Sarkis. So you are, I guess, 
we are we are the same citizenship. So um, I wanted to look at the way my country, I mean Turkey, is 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 uh, managing its politics and its inequality. So when I look at uh, how my kids learn about constitution, I mean this is more a comment rather than a question, but how my kids learn about constitution, it's it's there's only one thing, and that is. Turkey is a republic, whereas I look at the rest of the world, people know their constitution. So when you don't know your constitution or your constitution is based on others, i.e. in Turkey's case, Swiss constitution, you cannot expect democracy to be more than uh, a way to you know, vote. So if you ask a typical citizen in Turkey who is middle class or lower middle class, what they will understand from democracy will be the right to vote, not the right to speak the truth, not the right to be able to say what you think, but simply the right to vote. Then we come to the political system. People are captivated by almost like a Stockholm Syndrome-like way. So the government disseminates this power where people do not have any other choice, and they feel, well, if they make another choice, they have the problem of security, they're gonna be, you know, uh, rid of their rights uh, to vote. They're going to be rid of their opportunities in business. Um, so then comes this issue with the youth. Now, if you have government staying in power for years and years, the, the generations basically grow with that government. The only thing they know is that government and how, it's, how, they, how that government manipulates the kids or, or, or the people. So, so I guess there has to be almost a capital move from the Northern Hemisphere to the Southern Hemisphere. And that is, for me, a very fundamental change in thought process. Uh, because as long as capital follows wealth and opportunity, as long as capital follows and does not care about the 10 million people dying of sulfur in the Southern Hemisphere, as long as capital does not care about these political parties, which almost like makes people follow for the sake of following, but not for the right of following, then uh, how do we make this world equal? I mean, how do we have equality? Uh, you know, I'm very privileged because I went to, 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 to Harvard and I'm, I'm happy to get involved in politics, but then I don't want to be a pep. So how do I not become a pep? And when I open a bank account, my KYC immediately says she's a pep and she cannot be involved in politics. So how can I make a change in the world if I cannot get involved in my country's politics? So these are very big issues. I guess India is very similar to this in, in, a, in that aspect and maybe Latin America. But I believe change will not come from the likes of the US democracies, but it will come from <coughs> understanding what democracy really means for the Southern Hemisphere or the countries like us. And it's not just right to vote. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, questions, further comments? <coughs> yes, there was a hand in the back. Yeah. I'm sorry, so I'll go to you next. So uh, for, over there and then you, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Thomas Kasimbi. I'm a mid-career student here and CID ambassador, student ambassador here. So I'm just kind of working off <coughs> of um, Dr. Mehta's um, comment and probably to the American um, panelists, um, basically just thinking through around the, the exemplar um, reference that he made. <coughs> so there are a number of local government and state legislatures where the, democratic gov the, demo the Democrats actually hold <coughs> a significant majority and can actually push through some of the national policies that they, um, you know, kind of say that they want to kind of push, push forward. Um, and we haven't seen that, um, a significant amount of <coughs> these states. So why do you think that's the case? And how do we move the needle forward so that at least there are these exemplars in terms of what a democratic agenda looks like? Um, at least at the local government and state level. Thank you. Um, let's take uh, one more question from over there. Yep. Okay. I was. Uh, <coughs> th 
thank you. First of all, this has been very informative, and I also, like Jim, and with the uh, Advanced Leadership uh, Initiative, um, and we're all very concerned about democracy. I want to ask a broad question as it relates not only to the use of capital, education, <coughs> and uh, political parties, but as it relates to your individual, from your perspectives, are you long-term optimists or pessimists <laughs> about democracy? And I'd like to hear <coughs> a little bit from each of you. OK. Um, are there other, before I turn to the panel, yes, there's a question or comment back there. Thank you. My name is Elaine White. I am also a fellow at the Advanced Leadership Initiative, but I am also a citizen of Costa Rica that very recently had elections and we after a long period of increasing inequality, we saw a candidate that ran on a populist platform win the elections. And uh, this question is directed to uh, uh, Pratap uh, Mehta, because I, I was led with many reflections uh, after your statement that inequality erodes the quality of, of democracy. But I don't know in which direction or what comes first, because it seems like in the many cases in Latin America, increased um, wealth concentration has gone hand in hand with the erosion of political parties, therefore of the, the uh, uh, political uh, articulation in society. And therefore it seems that the more concentration of power, the more the elites have the shortcuts to, I mean, more concentration of power and weaker political um, parties seem to uh, increase the potential of, um, of the elite to get policies adopted that go in, in their favor. And this ends up then creating a populist uh, demand. So I would like to, to hear your reflections about this, the sequence of this erosion of democracy. Thank you. I will take one final question from the floor before turning to the panel for their final words. Yes. I am. I'm Karim Sarhan. Can you hear me all? Yes. Okay, perfect. I'm Karim Sarhan. I'm a research fellow at the Center for International Development. My question to all the speakers um, is the left, left versus, light, uh, versus right debate helpful for the cause of fighting inequality or harmful? In, in, in the sense that I feel that both the right and left have exploited the inequality cause for political gains. So is it time now to start thinking about more pragmatic solutions to address inequality away from uh, the ha typical hats of ideology? Thank you. Thank you. So let me turn back to the panel now. We have uh, only a minute and a half left, so very quickly. <laughs> just, just finish your comments with one word, optimist or pessimist, so we know where you stand. Long-term optimist, short-term pessimist. So. Jacob. <laughs> Jacob? That was it. Long-term yeah. optimist, short-term pessimist. Yeah. Okay. okay, that's it. But I, I have an answer to the other one, but we'll, we'll, we'll see if we have time for it. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. We have. Oh, who want, Who needs twenty-minute break, right? You just. You just uh, <laughs> I just wanted to address the really important question about what's happening in blue places, states, and and localities. Basically, all the cities in the United States are blue now. I mean, a lot of them are nonpartisan mayors, but um, but I think it's really important to emphasize how limited their capacity is to address some of these structural issues in the in the political economy. Um, there is, I think, a big. Um, a big story, and it gets back to the, to the Democratic Party, which is the fundamental source of the kind of deepest inequality in the United States is geographic, racial, and economic segregation. And our policies are just deeply decentralized in these areas, local zoning and education policies in particular. And, um, and I think this is, in my mind, the deep Achilles heel of the Democratic Party today. So the great promise of the, that the Democrats have, right, is that they're attracting partly because of uh, many, many uh, more affluent voters have been turned off, were turned, have turned off by the turn of the Republican Party. They're attracting new and, and, and more affluent constituencies, right? But the, the challenge is that to really 
to really address inequality in the United States, we're going to have to tackle those kinds of deep inequalities at the local level. And so what we don't see yet on a large scale is states stepping up and really trying to, to move forward, right? The national government, you can see what the Democratic Party has not wanted to broach these issues. So the one biggest example is affordable housing, right? Yeah. So California is actually doing a lot more than we've ever seen at the state level on this front. Um, and I think that's a, a case to watch, because after all, California is like the sixth, if it were a country, it'd be like the sixth largest country in the world. Um, but at the national level, the sort of solution to a lot of the internal fissures of the Democratic Party in the Build Back leg Better legislation was basically, let's just, let's just spend on everything that everyone cares about. And of course, it didn't happen, right? There wasn't really any efforts to address these, these issues. And to me, that's, for, if we're thinking about like organization and, and real investment in the Democratic Party, particularly among non-white voters, like that's, the party's gonna have to step up on that front. Um, and to me, that's the next sort of great battle within the party, whereas before, I think um, it was a lot about, you know, our wealthy donors pulling the party to the right on, you know, big, large-scale kind of economic issues. Now it's really like, can the party tackle the deep, in a, the high levels of inequality in blue places and the deep inequalities that are resulting from geographic, racial, and economic segregation while relying more and more on affluent suburbanite, white suburbanite votes. And um, in that, that sort of my long-term optimism is that I actually think it can, but um, my short-term pessimism has to do with the fact that I, I don't think it's gonna happen without real, real active organization activity, as I've said before. Thank you, Jacob. Alicia, okay. final comments? Just, let me just apologize. I had a terrible allergic reaction this morning, so my coughing is not COVID. <laughs> but briefly, I think my last comment really dovetails with that, which is, you know, electoral democracy is not going away. The idea people will vote for their leaders is not going away, but democracy as a practice, and also democracy that depends on political parties to organize interests, I think is under threat. And I'm optimistic in the long run that we will find new organizational models and new ways to incorporate technology to mobilize people, especially given the sort of political polarization that we're seeing. But I think in the short run, that is very difficult work um, and quite Thank you. Brought up final words. Well, I'll use that cliched line, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. I thought that was the end. We'll just stop yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> we can not improve on that. <laughs> well, um, I, th I want to thank our, our um, uh, panelists, Pratap Mehta, Alicia Holland, and Jacob Hacker, for a very stimulating set of comments. Um, it's clear that we need both new ideas and new organizational modes uh, to address the questions that we're facing. It's clear that it's not a very clear, straightforward relationship between inequality and, and the equality of our democracies. Uh, it's clear to me that um, a particular brand of technocratic elitism has played a very significant role uh, in undermining the quality of democracy in all of these regions. So I think the challenge for us, particularly in a place like the Kennedy School, um, is uh, while we're brandishing these, um, uh, these uh, um, uh, the ideas and, 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 and new organizational modes that, that we stay away from that uh, technocratic elitism that we're able to, to, um, to avoid that. Let me also thank you all for uh, being such a good audience and for your questions. And now you have deserved a break um, and I have not taken all of it. So I think you have a 15 minutes break um, and, and see you in the next session. <laughs>